and so welcome to Math 408. So this is an interesting class. Um, I'm going to save the real introduction for the material for Monday when I believe we are allowed to start in-person instruction. What I want to do today is give a quick overview of what the class is going to be like to give you a sense of uh, is this what you want to be doing. If you have not been getting an email from me, please email me. Uh, probably everybody has gotten one by now. I don't use Glow. I maintain my own web page using you know, terrific 1990 technology. It is primitive looking, but when I get emails from OIT saying we have now upgraded, I can just hit delete and I don't have to worry about any of those issues. Everything is easily accessible so anybody in the world can use it and I don't have to worry about sharing privileges. So what I want to do in this class is talk to you about, you know, one of the most fascinating problems that you will never be able to directly visualize. You know, how do you pack spheres in arbitrarily many dimensions? And in small cases, it's not that bad. And you can think of what does a sphere look like in three dimensions and two dimensions and one dimension? So what would a sphere look like in one dimension? Yeah, I'm seeing, you know, just an interval. So packing intervals is not going to be that much of a challenge. When you start packing spheres, it becomes a bit more interesting. I serve on a regional school committee, as several of you know, and I actually have suggested that we pack our, I'm sorry, that we allocate space for our students in a different way that is being done to take advantage of some geometries. We're going to talk a lot about how do you efficiently pack things and why might we care? And so one of the biggest applications is error detecting, error correcting codes. You want to be able to transmit information. And the question is, how do you tell if you have transmitted the information correctly or not? And so in particular, if you make a mistake, how bad is it to make a mistake? Well, if you know you've made the mistake immediately, you can just go back and resend in many circumstances, but not always. You know, imagine you're a submarine commander you only surface at certain moments. You can't come back and get an additional message. If you're at the grocery store and it doesn't scan your item, well, it's not a big deal to scan it again. When you're downloading a you know, five gigabyte file, if you have crappy Wi-Fi at home like I do, you don't want to have to download the whole file again if there's a few errors. And so you want to correct the packets as they're coming in. As technology gets better and better and better, you can actually have more and more redundancy in your codes. I will talk maybe a little bit about the Voyager space program and just the technology that was available when they had to launch the probe to see all the outer planets. That alignment only occurs every few hundred years, wasn't quite ready, but you had to launch at a certain time. So they launched the best thing they could and they upgraded it as it was traveling billions of miles from Earth. So a lot of phenomenal mathematics is gonna come into this. So it's not just theoretical mathematics. It is, trust me, there's going to be plenty of theory up the wazoo. But it's theoretical mathematics that has real world applications. So there's going to be a wonderful mix of the two. So I am in the middle of writing a book on this subject with a friend of mine who has the best possible name in the world. Anybody want to guess what that name is? Steve Miller. Yes. So we were born same year, same city, both Jewish, both went to Princeton for graduate school, had the same thesis advisor. Uh, we actually shared an office uh, as postdocs at NYU. When I was a first year at Princeton, he was in his last year, he's smarter than me, he was finishing up. I actually got his job offer from Neil because when Neil came, they never knew which Steve Miller to give it to. And they knew I went to Yale as an undergraduate, so they gave it to me and so I opened it up and went, oh my God, I have a job offer to be a postdoc. And that's not so bad as a first year. I heard professors at Yale when they were told that Steve Miller from Princeton was being hired as a professor were curious as what the hell did I prove as a first year graduate student that I was coming back so quickly. But he is a phenomenal person. You know, he has worked uh, for a lot of places that actually apply stuff like this. And so it is a wonderful opportunity to take the math that we're doing and actually talk to some experts who actually see it. So he's at Rutgers right now, you know, great person to know. So what we're going to do is each day is going to be converted into you know, lecture material for the book. So everyone is gonna take turns being point for writing up the notes. One of the reasons to do this is to really train you on how to do 
good scientific technical writing. This is an extremely valuable skill. Um, it would be wonderful if this was a writing intensive class because this is writing that's going to be read, but it's just you know, really good work to know. It's also good to learn how to type quickly and to get quick at that. So everybody has their own way of doing it. Uh, if you've ever heard the song Dueling Banjos, I, went, I once did the LaTeX version of that at a math conference is I was sitting next to a senior colleague and both he and I can LaTeX in real time. But we have very different styles. I love the shortcuts. I have shortcuts for everything. You know, slash BE is begin equation. Whereas he loves the drop down menu. And so it was a battle to see who could type the lecture faster. And in the end, I won because I could also do the images. And I would just dump something in Microsoft Paint, dump to Mathematica, convert to an EPS, put in the, but you know, how long does it take you to do something? And you want to get proficient at this. The other reason I want you to be working on the book is how many of you are considering careers in mathematics? Okay, not surprisingly, a lot of hands are going up. This is what you would expect in a 400 level math seminar. At some point, there is this transition moment when you go from one side of the desk to the other. Rather than being on the receiving end of questions, you are the one who asks the questions. So one of the reasons to have you working on the book and working on converting each lecture into a chapter or a section is for you to actually work on how do I want to present this? What additional material do I want to add? What questions should I create? And I really want to talk to all of you about how do you create questions? This is one of the research, the ability to ask good questions. And so you know, I'm happy to be you know, flexible in terms of you know, the course mechanics. You know, if people are dying for midterms and finals, I'm always happy to do that. If people want to do more you know, homework writing and you know, you're looking at papers in the field, I think that's a very productive way to go. There's a lot of phenomenal math that's being done. You know, this is the advantage of teaching a small class is we can personalize it. And so my goal is to try to excite you. you know, this is one of the most powerful areas of mathematics. And what is absolutely amazing is some of the best ideas are the simplest. So I do number theory. One of the greatest insights we have is if you have an even function, that means you know, f of x equals f of negative x. So think cosine. If you have an odd function, f of x is negative f of minus x. What must be true about any odd function? So I give you f of x is negative f of minus x. So is there any point where you understand this function? So, yeah. Uh, at zero, it must be zero though? At zero, it must be zero because if f of x is, is negative f of minus x, then f of zero is negative f of zero, so f of zero has to be zero. It is amazing how powerful that observation is. And it's actually interesting, you know, trying to track down who was the first person to have that insight that for some of these problems in number theory, we know that it has to vanish at the center because it's odd. So what I want to do is I want to try to illustrate some wonderful concepts. I want to try to talk about how might you generalize. And so whenever you see things, you should always be asking what's next, what's next, what's next. So we are going to have a extremely non-standard first lecture. So in terms of the course content, this is probably going to be the most basic. So I'm going to switch now and move to my screen. And so this is a talk that I did give at Williams College uh, last year uh, at a moment's notice there was an issue and they needed a speaker. And so I happily stepped up. It's one of my favorite talks to give. It's joint a little bit with Professor Garrity. If you have already seen it, um, try to act interested. If not, just pretend that there's a malfunction with your video. And so what I want to do is talk about the Pythagorean formula. I'm going to assume everybody has seen the Pythagorean formula. This is one of the most important formulas in all of mathematics. It's what we use to measure distances. Okay, so we often say a proof. 
rather than the proof. And the reason is different proofs highlight different parts of a problem. And sometimes one proof generalizes better than another. This summer, one of my small groups was trying to extend work from a previous year in a pub on more sum than different sets. And unfortunately, when they went to higher dimensions, the arguments that were done in the earlier paper did not generalize. And they came to me and they were stuck. And I said, well, the small paper that you're trying to generalize, that's not the first paper in the subject. There was an earlier paper by Nathanson, and it didn't have as strong of a result, but it was a different approach to the problem. Maybe that would generalize better, and it turned out that generalized much better. And it was a really good lesson to learn that sometimes the most recent result is not actually the one you want to be using, that there are different approaches that all have their own value. And again, that's really the point of this. I have discovered as I've gotten older and older and older, I've never gotten a job because I know more facts than someone else. What's really important is the creative thinking of how to attack a problem. And that's why I want to spend a lecture like this just talking. So a lot of times you can be drowning in algebra. So going from one line to the next, I can follow it, but how the hell did you come up with that? And I want to try to give you a sense of how you might be led to some of these. Always try to generalize, always make conjectures. The conjectures may be wrong, but try it. Another thing to really emphasize is the need to check special cases. Look at extreme cases. Try to get a feel for the problem. And the motivation for all of this is going to be the Pythagorean theorem. All right, so can someone state the Pythagorean theorem for me? Somebody. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Excellent. And the only freedom you have is you're not going to use X, Y, and Z. You're going to use A, B, and C. Everybody uses A, B, and C. The only real question is, do you have the triangle oriented like this? Or do you have A on the bottom? Or do you actually have the right angle on the other side? Now, that's really the only freedom you have in stating it. So the question is, how would you prove this? So there's a lot of different ways. So here's one, you're going all the way back to Euclid, Proposition 47, Book 1. And like any good geometry proof, it has a bunch of auxiliary lines. Uh, how many of you have seen this picture before? Okay, this picture never really meant that much to me. Putting in color doesn't mean much of a difference to me either. It doesn't really help. And this one, dear Lord above, help me. When you look at this, okay, obviously the things that are shaded the same color must have the same area, but how the hell did you come up with this partitioning? I have no idea. I also have no desire to find out how they came up with this partition. This is the first proof that I've seen that I really remember and it really stuck with me. I saw this in a physics class freshman year at Yale. So take the four triangles, and you always want to ask, what are we assuming? So I am assuming that we know that the area of a rectangle is base times height. If I know the area of a rectangle is base times height, how do I get the area of a right triangle? Slice the rectangle in half. Slice the rectangle in half diagonally. And now what you're assuming is that similar triangles uh, your, uh, no, so triangles that have the same dimensions will have the same area if they're rotated in space. So rotation does not change the area. And that is one of the assumptions of geometry. That as we move the triangle around, it's not going to change the area. And so I can form a big square of side A plus B. And if I put the four triangles down, it turns out these are all right angles. So it's a nice exercise. You know, if this, if this is x, this is y, this is x. x plus y plus 90 is 180, so that has to be 90. So it's a nice exercise. Convince yourself that those really are four right angles, and that is a square and not a more general rhombus. So the area, I can count two ways. It's a plus b squared from the big square, or it's the smaller square plus the four triangles. Each triangle has area 1 half a b. So the four triangles give you a 2AB. And so you get 
a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, the a plus b squared is c squared plus 2ab. Cancel the 2ab from both sides, and there is a proof. Here's a slight variant of it where I just move things around a little bit. And because these two triangles form a nice rectangle, you can prove that these are squares a squared and b squared. And now the two regions all have to have the same area. So the blue region on the left has to have the same area as the blue region on the right. And this is another proof that a squared plus b squared is c squared. Who is the most famous mathematical graduate of Williams College? Oh, I'm sorry. Who's the most famous graduate of Williams College who you can associate math to? There's several answers. The president that did the, that had that proof. Um, Garfield. 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 Yeah. President Garfield. And of course, his proof is completely different than the proofs we've seen here. It is completely different. So he's actually proving it using results of trapezoids. And you can see similarities in the other one, but he is credited with a proof of the Pythagorean theorem. And as a lesser achievement, he was also president of the United States of America. Okay, so there's lots of different proofs. The hardest part for some of these is finding the combinations that you need to look at. But when you look at this, do you have an understanding of why the Pythagorean theorem is true? Or do you just have the fact that, well, it's true, but I just don't see it. It's just a calculation. So what I want to briefly do is I want to quickly show one of my most prized possessions. It's faded over time. Uh, can you see the picture? So if you take any triangle and trisect the angles, you will get you know, two lines coming out from each. To each side, the two lines that are closest. And they will form three points of intersection. What can you tell me, what do you conjecture about that triangle that's formed? It's equilateral. It's equilateral. And so when I was in grad school walking to the department one day with two of my friends, one of them mentioned this. It's now called Morley's theorem. I think the Greeks conjectured this. And I said, oh yeah, yeah it's trivial to prove. Look at me, really? He said, yeah, just write down the equation of the points and calculate the coordinates of the points of intersection and then show that the sum of the squares, I'm sorry, show that the squares of the lengths are the same. And so my friend bet me, not that I couldn't, but that I wouldn't have the patience to finish the proof before we graduated. And so the bet was if I do it, he takes me out for dinner not to exceed 1250. If I don't, I take him out for ice cream not to exceed uh, 250. Both receipts are still there below. They are extremely faded and they're barely legible. It took me about a year and a half and no, I was not working on it consistently. Uh, the best angles or the best variables I found was just like tangent of one third of the angles. And I ended up getting polynomials of like degree 48 for the sides, expanded out with Mathematica, and then just subtracted and showed that the polynomials were the same an incredibly unenlightening proof. John Conway has one of the best proofs of the subject, where he starts with an equilateral triangle and reverse engineers to get to your original triangle. And so what I'll just throw out, you know, for something if you want to try, try to prove Morley's theorem. And if you can't, don't be discouraged. You know, look up Conway's proof. You know, try to write down how you would do it with coordinates, how you would generalize things, how you would maybe say without loss of generality, I can, assume, I can assume this about the shape of my triangle. Okay, so what I wanna talk about right now is dimensional analysis. So if you've taken a physics class or a chemistry class, you might have seen dimensional analysis. Uh, you might have seen like factor labeling in some of the analyses. It's incredibly powerful. So I'm going to imagine an alternate world. And in this alternate world, here are five proposals for the Pythagorean theorem. C squared is a to the 17th plus 17, and so on and so on and so on. So I want to go through them, and if you feel that this is a good candidate or a bad candidate, let me know. So any thoughts about the first? I am getting a thumbs down, so speak up. So uh, in class, whenever you have a good comment, email me after class that you made a good comment. If you made a bad comment, don't email me. 
or email me if you want. But you know, again, I don't care about bad comments. I want you to get comfortable speaking up, especially since this is through Zoom. I was far too nervous when I was a student and too often I did not speak up when I should and I didn't get a chance for the professors to always know me as much as possible. So get in the habit of speaking up. It's really important you want to be noticed. So can somebody tell me why the first one is bad. Like I can attach units like meters to A and B and C and then expand right. and right. they don't match up. Right, so we have meters squared is equal to meters to the 17th power. Okay, so the first one is bad. What about the second one? Um, does the second one lack like symmetry? Because you want- The second one lacks symmetry. So I'm very skeptical as to why it would be 17B squared and just A squared. Okay, what about the third? It could be negative. Which could be negative. On the right side. Even if it's not negative, C is going to be smaller than A. What about the fourth? Okay, so nothing is immediately coming to mind to say that the fourth one is bad. What about the fifth? There is an issue with the fifth, if you look closely. Is it because triangle inequality is bad? It's triangle inequality, excellent. So if you have a triangle, the largest the hypotenuse could be is if you have a 180 degree angle between A and B. And the largest the hypotenuse can be is A plus B. So if I look at A plus B squared, I get A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. So the 17AB is too large. So the only one that's possible is number four. It turns out to be false, but it's possible. Any reason why I have so many 17s? Why did I choose 17? Was this talk first done in 2017? It was not, but that's not a bad idea. I'm paying respects to a great mathematician. Mr. 17? No. Is it Ramunajan? Nope. Gauss? It's Gauss. So Gauss, you know, was the first one to show that you can construct the regular 17 gone with straight uh -oh. <laughs> in terms of you, know, what shapes can you do? I basically just needed something that was greater than two. So, okay, so we talked about why these are all bad, except possibly the fourth. So what I want to do now is I want to prove to you the Pythagorean theorem using dimensional analysis. So we have our triangle ABC. I'm going to let X be the angle over here. Do you agree that the area is a function of the hypotenuse C and the angle X? Because once I give you those two quantities, that tells you exactly how long B is going to be, and then your A is just going up. If you know trig, we actually know that the area is going to be C cosine X times C sine X divided by two. But again, we will assume right now we really don't know what these sine and cosine functions are. These are just names that, given a hypotenuse and an angle, we can associate a sine. All right, so the U is the function of the hypotenuse and the angle. Let's try to think about how it might depend. Can you think of any angle that might give you the same area as the angle X? The complement, correct? The complement. The area will be the same at 90 minus x. If I were to triple C, what would happen to the area? It would be 9x. It would be, uh, it would be 9 times. Yeah. So we can write the area function as some function of the angle times C squared. All right. So all good geometry proofs require you to draw an auxiliary line somewhere. So the question is, where do we draw the auxiliary line and the hint is we need right angles. Any thoughts about where we could draw a line? So I, want to, the, I want to get some right angles. From the intersection of A and B upon the hypotenuse? Yeah, there's really no other choice other than going from that angle to the hypotenuse. 
And what's nice is if this is angle 90 minus x, this has to be angle x over here. So all the triangles are similar. And I will give the triangles these wonderful names of one and two. And now we can use a great proof technique that if you break something up into parts, then the sum of the parts is equal to the whole. We've already seen this in proving Pythagoras earlier. And so again, what we're using is that the area is a function of the angle times the hypotenuse squared. What can you tell me about the area of triangle one? Must be f of x a squared. It must be f of x a squared plus f of x b squared equals f of x c squared. So now what can I deduce? Plus f x is not constant zero, you have to put that gradient theorem. Good, and you have to prove that f of x is not zero, but if f of x is zero, then the area is zero, which makes no sense. And now we have Pythagoras. So as another example of dimensional analysis, you know, imagine you have a mass on a, on a rod, it's at an angle x, has a length l in meters, mass in kilograms, force of gravity g in meters per second squared, the period you measure in seconds. And so you wanna calculate what's the period? What is the only way to combine these units and get a unit of seconds? So how can I combine these units and get a unit of seconds? So divide length by acceleration and then take a square root of the whole thing. Yes. Mass cannot come into play because mass is in kilograms, nothing will cancel that. So it has to be some function of x, and x is going to be in radians, it's unitless, times the square root of L over G. So before we even go to the lab, we know if we were able to quadruple the length, then the period would double. If we were somehow able to quadruple the force of gravity, we would be able to have the period. This is the power of dimensional analysis, to be able to get a sense of what is the form. All right, so I'm talking about getting a sense of the form. So let's try to see what could be the Pythagorean theorem. And again, I know I am doing this in a problem where you already know the answer. It's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'm trying to do a general principle about how do you attack problems? How do you get a sense of what you might want to try to prove? So this is a 400 level course, so you all know how to prove things by induction. If not, you know, send me an email or just nod your head and look it up later. When you prove things by induction, is it hard to prove a formula for the sum of the fifth powers? What information is normally given to you when you're trying to prove something by induction? Hypothesis, like the basic. Hypothesis. Case. So for instance, if you're trying to prove sums of cubes up to n is I think n squared n plus one squared over four. Well, if I tell you what you're trying to prove, the induction proof almost writes itself in this case. It's much harder when you don't know what the formula is. There are ways to guess the formula. You, if you believe it's a polynomial, well, if you just try a couple of points, you can actually find the polynomial of the right degree that fits them. And then that would give you what you need for the induction. For a lot of things in mathematics, the hardest part is trying to figure out what to prove. There's a wonderful website called the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences, the OEIS. And if you have a sequence of integers, if you feed it in, it will tell you all the sequences in the world that it knows that start like that. And there's been several times in my career where I've gone to this site and then, ah, okay, now I have a sense of what the sequence is. You know, here's a formula for the nth term or a generating function or situations where it arises. So we wanna to try to guess the correct functional form for Pythagoras. So we'll have some free parameters and we're gonna really figure things out by looking at special cases. So let's the world is simple. And we'll try to start with a linear formula for Pythagoras. And when that fails, we'll try a quadratic form. If that fails, we would try a cubic, but we're gonna find success with the quadratic. So let's guess a linear relationship. 
let's guess C equals alpha A plus beta B. Any thoughts on alpha or beta? Any properties they must have? They need to be positive and equal. So one is positive and equal. We have some kind of symmetry. Yeah, they shouldn't be negative. They should be positive. They should be equal. What else? They should have no relation to the length, so they should be unitless. They should be unitless. Do you have any thoughts about their size? So I want to look at an extreme triangle. Can somebody give me an extreme triangle to look at? Oh, oh they should satisfy the triangle equality. Yeah. So like, it should be less than one or no, greater than Alpha one. plus beta should be less than one, right? So one thing is triangle called alpha plus beta plus one. But give me an extreme triangle. What's an extreme triangle to look at? Let's say where one leg is zero and the another leg is the, is the hypotenuse. Yeah, so let's look at what happens as A goes to zero. So we have a very thin triangle. So then the hypotenuse is really the same as B. So that tells us beta has to be one or it's not gonna work. And then similarly, we would get A has to be one, alpha has to be one. So the question is, does C equal A plus B make sense? Well, we're assuming it's linear and we're assuming we know the area of a rectangle is X, Y and the area of a right triangle is one half X, Y. So let's look at the 45, 45, 90 triangle, which if Pythagoras is linear, would have to be a one, one, two triangle. I know this is absurd, but let's see what would happen. Well, the area of the square would just be four, right? We can also calculate the area of the square by saying it's four triangles. Each one has area one half times one. So if you look at it as four triangles, you get an area of two. If you look at it as one square, you get four contradiction. There cannot be a linear Pythagorean form. And so we guessed a functional form. We by looking at special cases, we got some information about them. And at the end of the day, we saw that the only thing that could happen is if um, you know, two equals four. Well, two does not equal four, contradiction. So now let's go to a quadratic attempt. C squared is alpha A squared plus, beta, plus gamma AB plus beta B squared. So thoughts on alpha, beta, gamma, what can you say? So what are the first things you know about alpha, beta, and gamma? So alpha and beta should be the same using the same logic as before. Right, so alpha and beta have to be the same. It's going to be symmetric. Yeah. And also equal to one. Yeah, they both have to be one by considering the thin triangles again. And so we get alpha equals beta equals one. The difficulty is gamma. Yeah, we don't know what gamma can be. And if we know the triangle inequality, we know it should be somewhere between minus two and two. So imagine we have four triangles and let's take A equals B equals one. So we have the one, one C right triangle. So if we equate areas, you know, C squared is gonna be four times one half. So C has to equal the square root of two. So two C squared is equal to one, the alpha A squared, plus gamma times one, the gamma AB, plus one, the beta times B squared. So the only possibility is gamma equals zero. So C squared is A squared plus B squared. So did we just come up with a new proof of Pythagoras? No, we just did a special case. So I know several of you have taken classes with me in the past. So you have probably seen this before, so please do not answer. I want to get a sense of people's algebra skills. So if you haven't taken a class with me, what is 16 over 64 in lowest terms? Does the winter study cl class count as a class? Winter study class counts because if I did it, then yes. <laughs> Which is the legitimate class. I love winter study. I wasn't sure. I don't think I've seen this. So. Oh, if you haven't seen it, then, it's, then what is 16 over 64 in lowest terms? One fourth. One fourth. 19 over 95. One fifth. Great. Uh, 49 over 98. One half. One half. One more. 12 over 24. One, one half again. 
uh, it's actually one fourth, right? Uh, did I do the math wrong? Check. All right, let me check. Uh, 16 over 64, cancel the sixes and you get one fourth. 19 over 95, cancel the nines, you get one fifth. 49 over 98, you cancel the nines, you get one half. The way you divide two two digit numbers is if the anti diagonal is the same, you just cancel that. And so by that logic, 12 over 24 is one fourth. Just because you've checked something for a few cases does not mean it's true. The more cases you check, maybe the more confidence you get, unless you are checking maybe a biased set of cases. And so I have some conjectures that I have students working on for elliptic curves where I believe there is a bias in certain moments of elliptic curves. The problem is the sums that you have to do are very bad in general, and most of the sums can't be done. Only for special families can they be done. In all of those special families, we see a bias, but maybe the bias is coming from the fact that these are very special families where we can do things. And so, you know, there are other families where we can't do the calculation, but we can do numerics, and the numerics do support the conjecture, so I have confidence in it, but it is not a proof. All right, so the next part of the talk is something that should have been done in your career. And I am embarrassed to say, I never really thought about this until I was talking to Professor Gowdy a couple of years ago. What would the Pythagorean formula look like on a sphere? Have any of you ever thought about that? So, this is one of the main reasons I am doing an entire class on the Pythagorean theorem. Essentially, this slide right here, the title slide. Whenever you see something in math, always be asking, how can I generalize it? How can I push it forward? What else can I do with it? How else can I view it? You know, okay, we've done the Pythagorean formula on a plane. What would it look like in different settings? So here is a wonderful picture that I have culled from the web of a triangle ABC on a sphere, and the sides are going to be you know, CAB opposite of the angle. Is it possible to have a triangle on a sphere where the sum of the angles is greater than 180? Yeah. What's the max you can make? I guess you can get to 180 on all of them. Well, not, not quite, but like, you can like approach arbitrarily close to 180 degrees on all angles. Um, I think so. I'm not sure. Uh, if it's I, I think you can get to 360 on all angles, maybe. To 360 on all angles. Ah. You can get to I'll, I'll 330. Can I get an isosceles triangle where all the angles are 90 degrees? Yes. 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 North pole to equator, equator over, equator back up. The smaller the triangle is, the closer the sum of the angles will be to 180. The larger the triangle, the more of the curvature of the surface you see. And so I'm going to write down things in spherical coordinates. Um, I always have to ask myself if this is being done correctly. This is the way mathematicians do things. Okay, yes, I have converted. Uh, is there anybody here who is also pursuing a degree in physics? No one is also a physics major? Okay. I am. I'm sorry, was that a yes? Yes. Who is the yes? Uh, here. Okay, so in physics, do you have theta as the angle coming down from the z-axis? Right. Yes, that's how I learned it because I learned it in physics as a freshman before I learned it in math as a freshman. And so I have to fight not to use the physics notation. The math notation is, well, we use theta for polar coordinates, so we should keep theta for the xy plane and have phi as the angle coming down from the z-axis. Later in the semester, we will actually need to work with generalized spherical coordinates in n-dimensional space. It's not too bad, but what's wonderful is for a lot of the problems, there's a wonderful trick from probability that allows us to do everything we need without actually writing down what the coordinates are. And I will show it to you. It comes from the fact that if you have a probability distribution, it has to integrate to one. 
Basically, it says something happens. And so if you have a functional form, whatever constants you have have to be such that when you do the integration, you end up with one. So if you don't know what some of the constants are, but you can do everything else, you can actually then deduce what that constant must be. So I'm writing down the equations of x, y, and z. So this is really a review of Calc 3. I'm not going to use too much of this material, but I just want to quickly show you some of the stuff. You know, do not worry about following all the algebra live. So what could the Pythagorean formula be on a sphere? So does anybody have any thoughts as to what it might look like? So we have a sphere of radius r, we have sides of length a, b, and c. What quantities do you think might really matter? So if I tell you a equals three, is that enough information or do you want something else? What do you want? Ying. If I tell you you're on a sphere and a equals three is a large, what do you need to know? The radius. The radius. The radius. So really, we want to look at things that depend on the ratio a over r, b over r, c over r. Those are the natural units to measure things. And in the limit when a, b, and c are small relative to r, it should look a lot like the planar Pythagorean formula. And that as a gets closer and closer to r, we might see some new features emerging, almost like special relativity. And that as the speed gets closer and closer to light, you see new things, but as the speed becomes very slow, you get back to classical mechanics. So maybe there's a relation involving cosines as arc length is related to angle. And so cosine of u is, you know, tail expansion one minus u squared over two factorial plus dot, 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 dot. So if u is small, the cosine of u is approximately one minus u squared over two. So if I look at the cosine of a over r, b over r, and c over r, and I tailor expand them, if I do a little bit of algebra, the you know, cosine of c over r is approximately cosine of a over r cosine b over r. What do I mean by this? Well, if I go through and multiply everything out, you know, I'll have one on both sides, I'll have a over r squared term on both sides, and then the r to the fourth term, I'm assuming a and b are very small relative to r. So something over r to the fourth is much smaller than something over r squared. So when r is very, very large relative to a and b, this term really doesn't matter. And c squared is a squared plus b squared. So if you run things in reverse, essentially I'm talking about starting with planar Pythagoras and moving upward. And so again, this is not a proof that this is the Pythagorean formula on a sphere, but this is at least something that reduces to planar Pythagoras. And now what you do is if you actually want to prove it rigorously, you just use a little bit of input from Calc 3. So we talk about the dot product of two vectors. So V dot W is the sum of V I W I. If theta is the angle between two vectors, then the dot product is the product of the lengths times the cosine of the angle. And then what we can do is we can use the law of cosines. So if I have two vectors V and W, I can find the length of the vector connecting them. And so you just you know, put in all the different algebra. And after some algebra, you know, there's the proof. So the dot product is just the product of the magnitudes times the cosine of the angle. Now that I have these, I want to just start talking about my three points in my triangle. Well, without loss of generality, let's put one of the points just on the z-axis. And then, you know, I have to choose my next two points. And I can calculate, you know, what the lengths are of those points. And this is the reason why we use radians. Because when you use radians, the measure of the angle is equal to the length of the arc at least if the radius is one. If the radius is not one, then you have a scaling factor from the radius. But this is why we like to use radians. All right, so now I wanna choose my coordinates. Um, without loss of generality, I can always just choose for my second point, 
to be such that I come down and then I don't spin around in the xy plane. So whenever you can, put some zeros in places. And so if you go through and you write down the equations of the points and you just take the lengths, um, after you do all the algebra, spherical Pythagoras just pops up. All right, so keep going, generalize further. Anybody have any thoughts as to what we might try next? What kind of space? Hyperbolic? Hyperbolic. And so in the case when we were on the sphere, it was you know, the cosine of C was the cosine of A cosine of B. What do you think the answer might be in hyperbolic case? Well, I guess we had cosine of C over R is cosine of A over R cosine B over R. What might you guess in hyperbolic space? Hyperbolic cosine. Hyperbolic cosine, right? Hyperbolic cosine of C is hyperbolic cosine of A, hyperbolic cosine of B. And it turns out that that is correct. And the hyperbolic cosine functions are defined as one half e to the x plus e to the minus x is cosh, and with a minus sign it would be cinch. Any Foxtrot fans here? Probably not, but I will risk it. So in the comic strip Foxtrot, uh, one of the kids is a math geek, and he's at Camp Fulmore Science Camp with one of his friends, and the camp council is very upset because this lousy camp-issued calculator isn't working properly. It's given me, you know, the cosine of this angle is three, and anybody knows that the cosine of the angle can't be three. And the kid remarks, uh, you've got your calculator set into hyperbolic cosine mode. And then his other geek friend says, would you like my calculator? Some of us don't need them. So hyperbolic cosine, what happens as x gets very, very large? What does hyperbolic cosine look like? Looks like e to the x. Yeah, or well, one half e to the x. One half e to the x. And hyperbolic cosine is going to, hyperbolic sine is going to look like one half e to the x. And in fact, what you get is cosh squared x minus sin squared x equals one. So there's a lot of uh, similarity between trig and hyperbolic trig. All right, so you know a bunch of fun identities. You know, nice exercise to try to prove them. A quick conclusion: you know, get ready to explore, get ready to conjecture. Different proofs are going to show you different things. Try to look at special cases to get a sense of what may and what may not work. And so what I thought I would do for the very last minute is, you know, first ask, you know, are there any questions about the course or what we just did? All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to derive all of trig in basically a minute. All right, we ready? So we start with e to the i x is cosine x plus i sine x. So this is Euler's formula, you've hopefully seen this. If I look at e to the i x times e to the minus i x, that's e to the zero, which is one. And when you go through and multiply everything out, you'll get cosine squared x plus sine squared x is Pythagoras. If I take e to the i x, e to the i y, this is e to the i x plus y, and that's going to be cosine x plus y plus i sine x plus y. But this is also cosine x plus i sine x times cosine y plus i sine y. And when you expand this out, you'll get cosine x cosine y minus sine x sine y plus i, and you'll have, um, I'll just choose to write it this way, sine x cosine y plus cosine x sine y. And so this, oops, so this over here has to just be the cosine of x plus y 
and this has to be the sine of x plus y. Because if you have two complex numbers that are the same, the real parts have to be equal and the imaginary parts have to be equal. There's one thing I need to just talk about briefly. So any questions on this before we do the last thing? I know we're like one minute over. But... All right, so the very last thing for today is the following. I basically said e to the x times e to the y is e to the x plus y. Why is that true? So why is e to the x times e to the y equal to e to the x plus y? Isn't that just the base property of exponents? Like, or the definition of the log function, I don't know. What's the definition of e to the x? E times itself x times. <laughs> what does it mean to raise a number to an irrational power? How do we define e to the x? Some. We use a Taylor series definition? Sum, n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. So e to the x, e to the y is really the sum n goes from zero to infinity of, oops. Um, of x to the n over n factorial times the sum n goes from zero to infinity of y to the m over m factorial. And we believe that this should be the same as the sum, say k goes from zero to infinity of x plus y to the k over k factorial. So think about how you would actually prove this. You need to prove this. It is not trivial to say e to the x, e to the y is e to the x plus y. You have to go back to the definition. And so for Monday, try to prove that e to the x times e to the y is really e to the x plus y. Any questions on class mechanics? Yeah, what, what um, resource are we going to use as a textbook? So uh, we're using the book that you're writing. And so I will make available notes from Miller and Miller. But we will also be looking at a lot of current papers in the subject. And so there have been some remarkable advances in the past couple of years on sphere packing. So you may have heard of the Kepler conjecture, the optimal way to pack spheres in three-dimensional spaces, the cannonball formations, hexagonal lattice, where you have hexagons at each level and you just offset them so that the balls go in. And so I will bring you know, a variety of spheres of different sizes to class so that we can actually you know, experiment a little bit with them. Or maybe due to COVID, you can watch me experiment with them. But you know, it is a monumental achievement what Hills did. And his proof was a mix of theory and experiment, or not experiment, uh, computation. And there were real issues in how the math community responded to a proof that had so much computation in it. You know, the first real proof like this was the four color theorem from a few decades earlier, where if you take any nice map, you can color all the regions using just four colors so that no two regions colored red are next to each other. Which US state could be a problem, but is not? Anybody know? Oh, Michigan? Yes, very good. And so I will punch up Michigan. Why is Michigan so bad? And again, I'm from Ohio State. Well, I taught at Ohio State. So I know several reasons why Michigan is evil. <laughs> It's discontinuous. Um. Michigan is discontinuous. And so you actually have the upper peninsula over here. Now it turns out not to matter, 
But if you have a disconnected state, you know, if your Iowa was actually part of Michigan, that could be a problem, or maybe South Dakota or something like that. Which would make sense, because if you could put some of your state inside other states, you're going to kill what colors you can use. And so one of the real questions is, what do you do with math proofs that have a tremendous computation component? How confident can you be of the result? As opposed to the math proofs that are done by humans that have you know, 300 pages of technical arguments that rely on other papers of many, many technical arguments. And it's a real issue for the community sometimes as to uh, how do you decide if a proof is correct or not. Other questions about the class? All right, so I will email later today your know, stuff to be thinking about for uh, Monday. We will uh, begin by talking about packing problems in one dimension. It will not take us long to discuss packing problems in one dimension. We will then move to two dimensions. We will be very successful in two dimensions. And you would almost think by induction, three dimensions shouldn't be that much of a problem. But like many things in mathematics, as the dimension increases, the complexity becomes significantly harder. And we will eventually see that for some problems, we actually have much better answers in certain higher dimensional spaces than others. The 24 dimensional space turns out to be a really nice space to work on. A lot of what's going to happen is going to involve mathematical lattices. If you are interested in going to grad school, you know, even just thinking about it, you know, please shoot me an email, give me a little bit of a sense of what you are studying or what you might want to study, um, what areas really excite you. And you know, as much as possible, I want to try to adjust the class a little bit to take into account you know, what your interests are. You know, the reason I chose this for a senior seminar is there's just a lot of tremendously good mathematics connected to all of this. All right, have a great weekend, and I believe we are allowed to start in-person classes on Monday.